My name is Jocelyn Fauser and I'm the Agronomy and Horticulture Research Assistant out at the Southeast Research Farm in Beersford, South Dakota and I'm also a full-time graduate student. My project in 2023 is looking at different cabbage varieties and how they interact with living mulch and the yields that result from them. So this coming spring, I believe, the land that we are utilizing for the horticulture research out at the Southeast Research Farm will become certified organic. And within that, you have to like look at different management practices with like um, integrated pest management and even looking at like the amount of weeds that we have within the weed bank out there. And so we're looking at different practices to allow organic farmers to work better with land while having certified organic land. Looking at the living mulch that we're utilizing, we're um, looking at three different clovers. So there's a red clover, a white clover, and a white Kira cross clover. And within my aspect of the research, I am taking over the clover plots that were established last year. And so we had quite a hard winter. We were not sure if the clover was going to overwinter, but with them being perennial, it was interesting to see that a lot of them did come back. And it was enough so to where we could still move forward with our project again this year. We did try to do a um, seeding with the drill but a lot of them did not come up because of moisture issues. So that is a key thing within clover is you want it seeded shallowly, but not too shallow and it's kind of picky with the amount of moisture it gets. Some of the benefits with using a perennial clover as a living mulch is it allows farmers to have a um, ground cover throughout the winter and throughout the whole season, which offers a very good competition against weeds and it reduces soil erosion and leaching of nutrients. Clover as a living mulch also helps with the amount of water percolation that can happen when a rain event occurs because if you think about it, if you have a bare exposed ground and rain comes down, a lot of that will often run off and run like away from where your crops are. And so with having a clover living mulch that allows the water to slowly percolate through those micro and macro pores that are being formed with the clover roots beneath the soil. I am managing the soil within where the cabbage is growing through different managements. So the first management with having the clover out there as a living mulch is no-till. There is also an aspect of landscape fabric that we are incorporating because a lot of producers are trying to walk their way towards more sustainable options to plastic and ways to compete with weeds. So within that we also have no-till fabric and then we have tilled just without fabric and then we have tilled fabric. With those different managements within the clover, I am noticing a lot of water and moisture differences. I actually have 16 soil sensors out there to manage and to look at the temperature and the moisture at like different field capacities within the clover managements. And I'm noticing that the clover, which the cabbage is planted directly into, is often sucking up a lot of the moisture and the cabbage are often wilting by mid-afternoon. Compared to the no-till fabric, there is often a lot of moisture left within there as there's competition between the fabric and the clover, which kind of reduces that moisture uptake. The tilled bare ground, that often has the need for water, a little bit more so than the clover, um, like the no-till clover. And then the tilled fabric, that one is kind of the mediocre one. So when I'm out in the field kind of looking at the moisture needs and thinking about cabbage and the need for it not to be overwatered because of possible like dampening off or root rot issues, I often have to look between the four different managements and make a decision in the medium like level of what moisture is needed when. For this trial, we are watering everything the same, which has been quite a challenge for me this year. In the future, it would be very interesting to look at the different managements separately and then look at like when they actually need water and how that all compares to each other and then in turn how that impacts the yield of the cabbage. So when looking at my project, I was kind of torn between doing one variety or multiple varieties. And when looking at it from a producer and a farmer's perspective, you often want to have your cabbage ready at different points in time so that you don't flood the market and then you also don't have all your eggs in one basket. So I decided on three different varieties 
and there's an early maturity, a mid, and a late maturity. The early maturity is the Ferrero, the mid maturity is the Famosa, and the late maturity is the Diodon. The Ferrero and Famosa are green cabbages, and the Diodon is more of a red-purple cabbage that will deepen in redness as the frost kind of starts to hit it a little bit. And the Famosa is actually a crinkly leaf green cabbage, which is very interesting, and it's very pretty out there. And then the Ferrero is a smooth leaf cabbage. When looking at the planting date versus the target harvest date for these cabbage, they were transplanted on July 21st. And we are looking at a possible first harvest of the Ferrero end of September. During the cabbage harvest event, we are going to be collecting data on seven of the nine plants within each 30-foot row because within the 30-foot row we have three 10-foot sections which is split up into the three varieties. So when looking at those seven data plants that we take, we're going to be looking at firmness, um, which is kind of an aspect of how tightly are the leaves wrapped, and then also the quality of how much insect damage, as there's been a lot of cabbage looper and worm issues this year out at the farm. And then we're also going to be looking at fruit quality analysis. So like the different sugar levels within the cabbage and the nutrient qualities of it. Throughout the entire season, it's not just an aspect of sitting back and kind of watching things grow. It's also a lot of data collection within the living mulch. So we are taking quadrats and we are cutting the clover like at the base near the ground and then we are separating the clover and the weeds into two separate bags. And the focus of that is to bring up the concept of how much weed biomass is there compared to clover biomass and kind of comparing those to look at the efficiency of like choking out the weeds within each clover um, treatment. There's also a bare ground treatment within there. So there's a whole block and then it's split up into four sub blocks. So we do have a bare ground aspect in there as the control, which often is just complete weeds out there. With this being my second year within the project of the clover being established, we're also looking at the different aspects of soil health, which there is another um, professor and a graduate student looking at those aspects and working with us. And spring soil sampling is done every spring, which is key even for my fertilization strategies within the cabbage. And making sure that we don't have a buildup of the micronutrients and allowing our abilities to kind of connect with the organic goals along with like soil health properties and how even as I mentioned earlier the soil aggregates and how water permeates through the soil. My big picture IPM which is integrated pest management for cabbage is to utilize beneficial flowers, crop scouting, and applications of dipel df which in involves um, the bacteria Bt within it. This year I decided to incorporate beneficial flowers into the system. They were planted into the guard rows in hopes of attracting pollinators and beneficial insects to lower the occurrence of things such as cabbage looper and white cabbage butterfly worms. So I decided on nasturtium, bachelor buttons, zinnias, and marigolds and they are planted kind of in a quilted pattern throughout the guard rows. I've been noticing that the beneficial flowers have been helping. However, when I do crop scout, the economic threshold levels of the cabbage loopers and the cabbage white butterfly worms have been above the economic threshold levels, which is two or more worms per plant. So I have been having to utilize an application of Dipel DF, which includes the bacteria of Bt within it and that has been helping. It is still a struggle, you know, seeing the holes on the cabbage leaves and such, but the key is to keep it at a lower level to where the cabbage plants don't start to become stressed with being defoliated, but they can still, so they can still allow that yield to happen. But then you also need to look at key things such as when the cabbage head is forming, that is a very key um, development stage because you do not want those worms entering into those cabbage heads and then reducing the quality or the marketability of it. Graduate school has been busy, crazy, hectic, but also an amazing experience. I have met a tremendous amount of talented people from all over the, the state and even from often different countries 
and the amount of knowledge that I'm gaining from other people's experiences and knowledge as we all come together has been really inspiring. And even just the community that I've found is like, it's a different level compared to my undergrad, which has been really inspiring. And it, it does make me happy and inspired to keep pushing on and to keep kind of learning and encouraging each other through the, the ups and the downs, because you inevitably, inevitably will have ups and downs but it's never enough downs to be like, I'm done with this. This research is funded by USDA Organic Transition Grant. To learn more about my research project and others like it, please visit the SDSU Extension website.